Where is the Roman Catholic Church going with Pope Francis? And this is a very practical and uh, important question to raise because Pope Francis is a very popular Pope, perhaps more popular outside of the Catholic Church than inside of the Catholic Church. And uh, uh, so we have to, if we want to understand the present day dynamics tendency of the Catholic Church, we need to come to terms with Pope Francis. And uh, I, I'm going to suggest a, a way of approaching Pope Francis by looking at three important uh, writings that are associated with him and that help us to have a picture of where he is coming from and where he is heading to. Pope Francis is the first Latin American Pope of the Catholic Church. And uh, before becoming Pope in 2007, he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires and also a Cardinal of the Catholic Church. And he presided over, he chaired a session of the um, um, Bishop's Conference of Latin America. The, College of all the bishops of Latin America. They met in Brazil, Aparecida, in 2007. And there, a document was drafted, and Pope, uh, the then Archbishop Bergoglio chaired the drafting committee. And the document of Aparecida is very important, where we find many of the uh, ideas that Pope Francis is now unfolding uh, as a Pope. We find there the theology of the people, his insistence that we do try to listen to the cries of the people. We try to adapt the practice of the church to the needs of the people. It is not so much that the people need to come to the church. It is that the church needs to adapt to the reality of the people. If people do not marry in church or do not live out faithful marriages, the church needs to provide for blessings and forms of uh, care for irregular couples, for even homosexual couples, if people do not come to get to receive the sacraments at the church, the church needs to find ways to get the sacraments out. If the people do not uh, manifest an interest in the official teaching of the church, the church needs to adapt its teaching to the desires of the people. You see this tendency, not so much top down, but bottom up, the theology of the people that has become very practiced under Pope Francis, where he says that everybody is a brother or a sister, where he says that even people outside of marriage can uh, receive the sacraments on certain conditions, where he says that even atheistic people, atheists, can be saved and will be saved. When he, when he, he calls Muslims and Hindus brothers and sisters and he prays, praises with Muslims and Hindus, that's the, the, an expression of the theology of the people, coupled with a strong Marianism, a Marian-oriented type of spirituality. Pope Francis is very Marian in his spirituality. He has a picture of Mary always in the pocket uh, on his heart in order to indicate that Mary is very close to his heart. He likes to live in rooms uh, where pictures of Mary are always on display. That is, that is an important 
writing that helps us to uh, come to terms with uh, Pope Francis. But then in 19, um, 1985, he gave a series of lectures in Argentina on the history of the Jesuits. And there he uh, presented a very critical view of the Reformation. As you all know, the Jesuit order is the first Latin American Pope, but he's also the first Jesuit Pope of the history of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Jesuit order was founded by Ignatius of Loyola in the 16th century to try to respond to the challenges brought about by the Protestant Reformation. And it is, uh, it is part of the DNA of the Jesuit order to be against the Reformation, to find ways to fight the Reformation. Now we have the first Jesuit Pope who is very friendly, apparently, smile with a smiling faith, face, but he, has, he is a Jesuit. He has a Jesuit DNA. And in 1985, he wrote and he gave a series of lectures on the history of the Jesuits, where he talk about, talked about Luther as being a nasty heretic, and even more so, Calvin being not only a heretic, but also a schismatic. Calvin said, Bergoglio beheaded the people of God from being united with the Father. The Reformation beheaded the people of God from its patron saints, beheaded it from the mass, beheaded it from the church. A very harsh assessment of the Protestant Reformation that has never been reformulated by Pope Francis. And it's interesting to, to know this because uh, it often comes out with being this smiling, embracing, friendly type of man. But, and of course, he is that. But he is also, deep in his heart, he is also a Jesuit and is also someone who has argued and written publicly uh, a very anti-Reformation assessment. And then, of course, the two perhaps main uh, texts of his pontificate are the apostolic exhortation Evangelii Gaudium, 2013, the same year when he was elected, and the most recent encyclical, All Brothers. These are the two main documents of the papacy, the pontificate. Evangelii Gaudium is a document, the joy of the gospel, whereby Pope Francis calls the church to a renewed missionary action. And uh, this is another very key word in his own language and teaching, mission, mission, mission. But we have to understand what does mission has to do in his own language. Mission, according to Francis, is not the, uh, the reaching out of the church with the gospel so that those who are outside of Christ may be called into a saving relationship with Christ by believing the gospel, repenting from our own sins and turning away from our idols to the triune God of the Bible. It is not that. Mission, according to this very important document, is rather the going out of the church in order for the people, wherever they are, who are already part of grace, they are already engraced, they are already experiencing 
various degrees of grace, it is the, the going out of the church in order to call all humanity to be closer to the fullness of grace. It is no, not the task of the church to go there to say, outside of Christ, we are lost. But it, the message of the church, according to Francis, is to go there to, to tell the people, we are already loved by God and saved by God wherever we are. Whatever we do, whatever we believe, we are already part of this saving activity of God. And the mission of the church is to go out there for the people to realize something that they may not realize. The word is the same, mission, but the meaning is very different. It's not so much related to the missionary task of the church, going out with the preaching of the gospel and doing the works of the gospel in order for those who do not believe to repent and believe in Christ. It is rather the task of the church to go out in order for the people who are far away from the church to be affirmed in what they already believe and affirmed in where they already are in order to be embraced by this merciful message of the gospel. In that document, Francis claims that in order to do this mission, we, we, we need to realize that we do not have to evangelize the Jews because they are already part of a, the covenant community. We don't have to evangelize the Muslims because they worship the same God as the Christians and we pray to the same God. And in doing so, Pope Francis quotes uh, the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium chapter 16. We don't have to evangelize the, uh, um, the other religions because in one way or another, they are already experiencing degrees of grace. And uh, as for the rest of the humanity, Pope Francis says, I quote, everyone is already justified by the grace of God. The message of the church is not a message of repentance and believe, but it's rather a message of come closer in order to experience in a fuller way what you already experience in your own way. And all brothers, it being the latest encyclical of Pope Francis, is again another step towards this all-embracing universalistic outlook of the Catholic Church as it is embodied and interpreted by Pope Francis. We are all brothers, all sisters. We are all, and brotherhood and sisterhood are understood not as consequences and expressions of our created humanity, shared created humanity. But Francis says, we are all children of God. We are all already loved by God to the point of being uh, saved by God. And that prompts him to pray with Muslims, praying to the same God, praying with people of other faiths, claiming that we pray to the same God, calling one another brothers and sisters in order for us to experience and to enjoy our brotherhood and sisterhood. You see, the language is there, the language of brotherhood is there, but it is, the, the meaning is changed away from the spiritual meaning of being brothers and sisters in Christ, making Christ us brothers and sisters, 
bonding us in Christ. No, Pope Francis claims that our human brotherhood and common sisterhood uh, is grounded on our common humanity and making it possible for us to pray together, for us to consider one another brothers and sisters. You see, this very much Catholic type of tendency and uh, willingness and uh, uh, agenda uh, that has been marking uh, Pope Francis's pontificate since 2013. This is uh, the way in which, th these are the questions that Pope Francis is asking us. He is opening up towards all kinds of people, not only towards evangelicals, although he has a, is well acquainted with forms of evangelicalism, but he is also very open to Muslims. He is also very open to secular people. He is open to all. He is wanting to um, express this Catholicity of the Catholic Church, whereby we are all already united, and wherever we are, we are already part of this bigger whole, and we need to uh, come to terms with it. Now, it's important for us to understand, very different perhaps from previous popes who had the tendency to stress the difference of the Roman Catholic Church with regards to other religions and even with regards to other Christian uh, bodies or denominations. Pope Francis wants to stress what is common, what is common to all. And it does so at the expense of basic Christian truths related to our sinful nature, our being separated from God apart from Christ, and being Christ the only way to the Father, outside of whom there is no salvation. Pope Francis's message is that we are already saved because we are human beings. And we are already saved because we are human beings, and we, therefore we are all brothers and sisters. The, the language, again, is similar. Mission, gospel, brothers, sister. The meaning is very different and leads us to, towards a different kind of gospel. Thank you very much. And again, I uh, leave up to you, Jamie, to um, lead us in this final Q&A session before our short break. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, OK, we'll jump right in with a short question here. What, how would you call the church before the Reformation? Would you call it the Catholic Church, the Christian Church, or what is the proper term? Yeah, very good question. It's, it's a Christian church. You know, the Reformation uh, with the Council of Trent, which was the response of the Roman Church to the Reformation, the mistakes and errors that were part of the Christian church before the Reformation tightened up, became more solid, and they were given a dogmatic status with a dogmatic language. And when I say dogmatic, I mean something that cannot be changed. Uh, prior to the Reformation, the Christian church was a mixed bag, so to speak, was something composed of different tendencies and elements and trends, the East, the West, different movements, different personalities, different traditions and theologies. And uh, it was after the Reformation that the Roman church uh, really took over uh, the previous outlook of the church. It, 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 prior to the Reformation, it was the church, it was the Christian church with several issues, and this is why the Reformation was necessary in order to address those wrong issues that 
the medieval church had absorbed and imbued, and it was in need to be corrected, but it was after the Reformation that the Catholic Church became Roman, more, more pronouncedly Roman Catholic Church. And with the dogmas um, um, excommunicate or, 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 or cursing uh, the, the Protestants, and moreover, with the tightening of the Roman structure of the church and with the Marian dogmas that followed the Reformation in the 19th century and in the 20th century. The church, the Roman church had become then very Roman, very Catholic, very Roman Catholic in distinction from the pre-Reformation church, which was more fluid and in many of these issues was more of a uh, combination of things rather than a very a clear cut uh, power structure with definitive dogmas. Great, thank you. Our next question. You mentioned that the Pope took on the role of the emperor. What about the rest of the Roman Catholic Church's clergy, such as cardinals, priests? How do they fit into the empirical structure? Yeah, very good question, thank you. If you think about the empirical, imperial structure, you have to think about the triangle. The triangle whose top uh, is where the emperor lies, and then you have the Senate, a college of aristocrats in the Roman society, and then you have a larger group of free men, and then you have the basis with the slaves, a larger number of slaves. So you have the pyramid, emperor, senate, free men, slaves. Now, if you take this picture and translate it into religious language and apply it to the reality of the Roman Catholic Church, you find the emperor becoming the pope. And not by chance, many of the papal titles are actually imperial titles. Pontif, Pontifex is one. Pontiff, you know, the bridge builder. It was an imperial title which was inherited by the Pope. And uh, head of state is another imperial title that nowhere in scripture, no apostle would have dreamt, or would have dared being called head of a state. Actually, the Lord Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is, what is God's placing a clear-cut distinction between the politics of earthly kingdoms and the activities of the church. And, but the Roman Catholic Church became an empire, and so taking imperial titles at the very heart of its own self-identity. The Pope is helped by a college of cardinals, which resemble the Senate of the ancient Rome and then followed by the priests, the bishops and the priests who are, who are a larger number and they do have some rights. They are the only entitled of uh, exercising the sacraments or implementing the sacraments. And then you have the slaves, the free, the laity at the very bottom of the pyramid with no rights apart from receiving what the priests give to them. No, and, and this was a very important issue that was raised at the Reformation. Uh, the, we are all priests before God. The priesthood of all the believers is a great biblical doctrine whereby we do not depend on someone who stands above us in order to receive the grace of God. By the Spirit in Christ alone, we can have a personal relationship with the Father. And that makes us priests at the same level as 
the pastors, the leaders, and the clergymen. So you see the structure that was uh, in a way copied into, pasted and copied into the church's structure. Great, thank you. Our next question. Some say that Pope Francis does not represent true Catholicism and they pray for a return. How would you respond so that you are dealing with the root of Catholic error and not just the errors of the current Pope? Thank you. Uh, there are various, as I said before, there are various critics of Pope Francis within the Catholic Church. Uh, I don't buy into these conspiracy theories uh, related to the unlegitimacy of the election of the Pope or the, the fact that he is not the Pope. Of course, his election uh, came in in very uh, peculiar ways. We have now two pope, living popes, which, is not be, which has not been the case for centuries. And uh, I, I understand that this is a unique situ historical situation, but I think Pope Francis is the legitimate Roman Catholic Pope. And I also think that he is uh, exaggerating, he is actually implementing the Catholicity of the Catholic Church to a point of uh, rebalancing the equilibrium between the Roman and the Catholic to another point. What I want to say is that he is actually expressing in perhaps ways that were not, uh, the Catholic people was not, did not anticipate or was not prepared to recognize, let alone to accept, is, uh, is pushing the pedal of Catholicity and uh, to a certain extent um, uh, downplaying the Roman aspects of the church, always being outward, always embracing, always affirming, and never uh, reaffirming the Roman identity, the Catholic sacraments, Catholic hierarchy, Catholic authority. And he's re refocusing the balance between the Roman and the Catholic elements. And uh, I think that this is part of Vatican II. This is not a new thing. This is part of the outworkings of what happened 60 years ago at the Second Vatican Council. So Pope Francis did not invent anything. He actually developed and unfolded, perhaps in a very short period of time and in a very harsh, in many ways, um, fashion, but it unfolded what Vatican II already provided for. This Catholic aspect, rebalancing the Roman identity of previous centuries. And this is not something that is going away at the end of, the, uh, of uh, Pope Francis. In other words, we are not going to see it going away with the next Pope. This is something that is permanent because it is part of the DNA of Roman Catholicism, Roman and Catholic. Francis is pushing the Catholic side. Perhaps we are going to have the next Pope or the next Pope's wanting to readdress the balance into a more Roman Catholic uh, balance equilibrium, but the two aspects will not go away. 